Okay, um, let's start. Um, my name is Dmitry. Um, I'm a senior here at Vanderbilt. Um, I'm excited to lead this full stack development workshop. Um, I would like to make this as engaging as possible. Uh, so feel free to turn on your camera if you feel comfortable to do so. Uh, also feel free to unmute yourself or if I'm going a little bit too fast or if you have any questions. Uh, also feel free to type any questions in the chat. Um, Ilya will be uh, more than happy to pick those questions up and, uh, answer, uh, and answer them or just ping me. Um, so uh, let's start. Um, so today we'll just do a little bit of a theory uh, behind the full stack development. And then we'll do a little bit of life coding after that. Um, in the life coding part, I don't necessarily expect you to follow along um, with the coding by yourself. So feel free just to uh, look through the process and understand the steps. And if you have any questions, just ask me. And then afterwards, if you would like to watch a recording, you can uh, you can watch it and uh, try to repeat all the steps on your own. Okay, so let me share screen. Can you all see okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So what is this workshop about? So this workshop is about getting hands-on experience building full stack application. Most likely in none of your CS classes, you will get a lot of hands-on experience actually building applications that you could be later on building uh, while working um, at different companies. Uh, also, we'll be learning all the different parts of full stack development, including project setup, backend and front end development, and then deployment and scaling. And also, I'll be using most up to date technologies uh, and I'll teach you how to use them and how to debug potential issues that you could have uh, while using those technologies. Uh, just general outline of our workshops. Uh, currently, we're aiming for five sessions, uh, but we might increase them uh, depending. Um, how, how uh, fast or how uh, slow that would go. Uh, so the first session, just general introduction to full stack development and project setup. Then in session two, we'll mainly be doing the backend development using REST API and test-driven development. In the third session, we'll be doing front-end development with a component library. And in session four, we'll be doing advanced features development. So that's something that I potentially would like to have your input on, uh, something that you would be interested in building, or I will be showing you how to build it. So that could be actually useful for you. And in the fifth session, we'll actually deploy our application um, so we can show it to the people who we know. So logistics, uh, we mean uh, every two weeks on Saturdays at 12 p.m. Uh, here is my email, dimitri.p.seminarvandible.edu. So if you have any questions uh, after the sessions or before the sessions, I'll generally be sending the email right before the sessions with the tools that you need to set up. Uh, so if you have any questions regarding that, uh, feel free just to shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to assist you. And just kind of general FYI, I'm by just no means an expert in full stack development. Uh, I am self-taught so full stack developer. I've been doing that for the past three years uh, where one year was professionally. Uh, I'm the same student at Vanderbilt University as you all are. Uh, so just take all my words with a grain of salt uh, and definitely take your time to explore on your own. Any questions before we start? Any questions about logistics, just general outlines of what the workshop uh, is about? Okay. Um, so I kind of decided to start off uh, with a meme of what is full stack development. Uh, full stack now means you can build front ends, write back ends, handle DevOps, start a podcast, curate a new seller, crack an egg with one hand, animate a Pixar movie and done. So that's essentially what the full stack means because in the nowadays, when you go work at a small startup and you expect it to build full stack application, you expect it to do everything. And that everything could, could, include, could include all the parts of the application building, including 
business uh, talking to the business people and um, working with the PMs and uh, doing a variety of other things that you don't think developer would ever be doing. Um, but what 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 is full stack development and what are its parts? So full stack development it is an ability to develop an application end to end. Uh, starting at user interface and ending with infrastructure. So essentially developing something that the client can see in their browser um, and then uh, deploying that at the bare metal somewhere on the servers in a cloud in some data centers in the middle of nowhere. And the five key topics that we'll be covering in a full stack development will be front end, uh, back end, database, development environment, uh, deployment and infrastructure. So where are you most likely to develop full stack? You're probably most likely to develop full stack in either startups or in a companies with small development teams. In the big companies, you usually uh, will be developing either backend or maybe a little bit more of infrastructure or maybe even some, some front end. But in startups and the companies where your development team is not as big, uh, you will most likely be touching everything. And that could start from front end, another day could be machine learning, another day could be deployments. And um, uh, they'll, they'll definitely uh, leave you, uh, give you a full exposure to all the technologies. So let's, uh, let's start with the, with the first part of the, of the full stack development. First part is the front end. So front end, think about front end is a tool to display user data. So right in the middle, we have a screenshot uh, and we have a, a New York Times page. So New York Times page is essentially some HTML, CSS and JavaScript uh, that's either being rendered on a server and returned back to the user or actually uh, using some single page application magic uh, being done on the being done on the client side. So think of it front end could be complex. You could do complex things on the front end, but essentially it is just a tool, it's just a place where application will be displaying its user data. The core of application, however, is in the business logic in a backend. So this business logic, and by business logic, I mean something uh, like, for example, uh, a money transaction. So let's assume you're transferring money in Venmo to someone. You open your application, you hit pay button, uh, and you say, like, for example, you wanna pay Saeed $10. Uh, so you click pay button, then that, uh, that request hits uh, some backend, which is essentially where all your business logic are going to reside. You're going to reside and the, the backend going to check, do you have enough money in your account? And then can you actually transfer this money to that person? So back, uh, business logic is essentially just validating and then performing different operations, uh, which I wrote down here as CRUD operation is create, read, update, delete, and then storing those uh, that those uh, piece of information in the database. And which I said, so database is essentially just place to store information. You can think of it as just some sort of container bucket where you just dump your information. You can dump it structurally using SQL or you can drop, dump it as a NoSQL, just a raw JSON. And I'll definitely, once we get to databases, I'll definitely touch more on uh, what's the difference between SQL and NoSQL is. And just kind of FYI, JSON is not a database. Uh, some, I think for some pet projects, you could be using JSONs to store your data, but it's not, you're not really storing your data. It's some temporary solution that's not very scalable. And then the, uh, the final part and also very critical part of the full stack application is, a, is deployment of the application. Essentially, you can build your uh, application all day long, but if you cannot deploy it and actually show it to the end user, it's worthless. So we'll be definitely, once we hit to session five, and we'll be actually doing deployment. Uh, I'll be touching more on each of those uh, pieces outline, but um, there are four main ones. You do static content deployment, which is essentially your front end HTML, CSS. And then on the back end, you have other server or you can do serverless and you, can all, you also have to deploy a database separately. And we will also do a little bit infrastructure as code when you set up your infrastructure uh, using actual code. And uh, as the sake of it, uh, I also included the development setup uh, as part of full stack development. Because uh, for me, that's essentially the part that directly affects us as a developers. And it's, a, it's extremely important for developer productivity. 
So imagine you are in CS2001 and then you get this instruction from Roth that tells you, hey, like you need to set up, set up uh, the compiler on your computer and you need to set up ID and you go through all the steps. Um, and then it might not necessarily make sense all the time. Uh, and sometimes it could be very long. Sometimes I remember like his instruction would be like seven pages and it could get really frustrating. So for developer, it's really important to set up, uh, to have a easy to use development setup that they can just start up um, and they can lend their code. So their code looks pretty. And part of it is um, documentation, of course, that has to be uh, written very well uh, in order for the, for the new developers to comprehend. So any question about parts of a full stack? Do all of them make sense to you? Okay. So let's transition into actually the project uh, that we're going to be building. So I thought it would be actually cool to build uh, or rate my professor clone because that side is kind of junk. It just looks horrible. Uh, so why don't we just build something new? Um, except this, uh, this, um, and this time we're building something a little bit different called rate my course which is essentially rate my professor clone, but with the emphasis on courses instead of professors. So, so where is this idea is coming from? What's the business problem that we're trying to tackle? So every time you about to sign up for new, uh, for new classes, or you just want to explore what the classes you potentially would like to take, there is no uh, a source of information where you can just go and explore those options. Yes, you can go on yes, but it's just general numbers slash time slash professor names. It doesn't give you a lot of information on what is actually the course is about. So instead, what we like to do is we would like to have an application where you can see all these courses with the rankings and actual students uh, filling out these rankings and um, kind of giving feedback of what this course is about. Uh, so if you, for example, a CS major and you would like to learn some finance or you would like to learn some foreign languages, you can go to the website and you can see which course are actually worth taking. And as I said, the current solution is mainly aggregated by the professors instead of courses. So you have to kind of scavenge hunt through the professors to understand like what course are they teaching and is this course good for you and is the professor good enough? Um, so how do we go from business problem to the develop? So in a typical company, and it's pretty much been uh, the way where I worked at, the CEO, the founder of the company comes up with some idea or comes up with some business problem they want to tackle. Then they communicate that idea to the product manager. And then the product manager actually defines the necessary criteria for the product and defines the features that would need to be implemented for the MVP, minimum valuable product. And then designers, then the PM uh, hands the job to the designers and then designers actually come up with prototypes. Um, and, then, and then here is where developers come, come in and uh, that's where we actually implement the prototypes. So we actually have a design for our application uh, so let me show it to you. Um, so it's essentially very basic. It's going to be three pages. So imagine uh, you're trying to choose a class for the next semester and you can't really choose it. Uh, so you come on our website called ratemycourse.com. Uh, you search your school, or which is in our case going to be Vanderbilt. Uh, as you search your school, all the different courses pop up. Uh, so right here, just for the design and convention purposes, they all name the same, but that's essentially will be different courses. Uh, different courses will be having different professors. So for example, in Vanderbilt, you could have Comporc or Discrete being taught by like four or five different professors. So have each professor will have its own ranking. Uh, then you can actually sort by professor and you can actually uh, sort it and filter by the course number. And then if you, as you go to the course itself, you can see all the current rankings, you can choose different professors, um, and then you can kind of get a sense if that's the class you would like to take. And then after that, you can just rate the class. 
uh, so you can uh, rate the course. So in difficulty, if you would take it again or not, and just kind of write the professor name. Uh, so that's kind of just the simple uh, design we, we have. And that's essentially what we're going to build and deploy uh, at the end of this workshop. Does the design make sense? Uh, does it make sense the business problem that we're facing? Okay. Um, so as we receive the design and we understand the business problem, now we're, that's where we as engineers come in and that's where we choose the tech stack. Uh, so here we're gonna go with, uh, on a backend, we'll use Express, No, Type, ORM, MongoDB, and Jest. You don't necessarily need to understand what of those things mean right now. I'll definitely cover more in details once we get for, to each session uh, for the back end um, and to the front to the deployment. So for the front end, we'll be using React with Carbon Component Library. Uh, so we'll just use quick and easy to use uh, component libraries so we don't have to uh, write custom HTML and CSS. And then we'll all deploy that all to the Verso, which is uh, one of the most popular uh, CDNs for uh, for deploying static content, and we'll deploy our server to AWS. Uh, that's essentially to the cloud, which is you're all going to use that once you're going to start working. Um, so here is the architecture of our application. Uh, this might look uh, a little too much, but essentially on a website you have a client machine. Uh, so imagine a user opens up the browser. Uh, goes to our website and on the website is our application is running that application communicates with some sort of server in that server is where we perform different um business logic operations uh in our case we'll be uh, rating the course or you will be actually getting information about the course and then we will be storing all that information in a in a NoSQL database uh, called mongodb so the information would flow as the application requests some information from the uh, from the backend where our business logic resides. Then the backend will retrieve that information from the database, process it, and return it back to the client. Any questions about the architecture or just overall tech stack? Um, any other questions? Is there a way to sort by department once you are in the, um, like the university like Vanderbilt? Yeah, so I mean, you can, uh, it all depends to uh, how we structure the data. Um, so if we, if we populate the department as part of our table, then we can uh, sort and filter by that specific department. Um, and it's not very hard to do, and I'll definitely show um, how we'll be using the query params, um, and I'll explain that more in detail uh, once we get to backend and uh, how we can use them to sort and filter by anything. Awesome. Is there a reason? Is there a reason why you chose that tech stack? Yeah, uh, I mean, so React is uh, most up to date uh, technology. You pretty much. I think majority of the companies using React right now. So that's for the front end. Uh, for the back end, uh, I chose JavaScript simply because it's just easy to get going and easy set up. Uh, and we don't have to spend a lot of time just figure out uh, how to get it up and running. Um, and also I've been mainly coding, coding full stack JavaScript. Um, so it's kind of just easily flows um, with what I've been doing. This this uh this might just be kind of out there, but once you install all your MongoDB drivers and like the React stuff, how does that stuff work when you get to deployment? Like when you put it on an AWS, like how does your local environment sort of transfer to whatever the hell is on the cloud? Yeah, so we'll I'll once we uh once we get to the deployment, I'll touch more in advance about this, but essentially when you do your local environment, you would want to set it up as close as possible to production. Uh, but essentially the way it's going to live in the production is that your front end going to get transformed to just basic HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And you will uh, deploy that um, 
as I said, to the Verso, which is essentially, it is running in a cloud too. And it was serving the HTML for you. And then it will be communicated with something that will be, uh, that where we'll deploy our backend, which is essentially going to be just a running server. And then the database was, will also be at some, some sort of server. And so all of them will be kind of communicating with each other, but the development setup essentially should look very close to what it is um, locally. But just think of that way, like locally you're running everything on your local machine. Uh, when you deploy it, you'll run everything on some, on some local machine on AWS. So that's just the idea, uh, just the basic idea of how it's working in the cloud. Cool, thanks. There are also a couple of questions in the chat. Like for example, David David asked, uh, if we use React, do we need to use HTML and CSS? Yes, so um, the, way, uh, the way it works, so uh, to the front end, as I said, front end is just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So you can write your full on front end a client using just basic HTML and CSS. But the reason we are using React is that we are using the nice syntaxes that was developed by the React developers. And then we convert all that nice syntaxes into raw HTML and CSS. So in the end of a game, uh, you get the same HTML and CSS, but because you're leveraging uh, someone's work and someone's improvement on how you should be writing HTML and CSS, we're just going to make it easier on ourselves and just write it using uh, using React, if that makes sense. Yeah, this is all for, for questions in the chat. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, great. Okay. So let's proceed to the, to the live coding part of this. Um, and just, I'll just give you a basic outline of uh, what is going to be. Uh, we'll be doing the project setup. We'll create a GitHub repository. We'll create a GitHub project board uh, and I'll explain uh, what, what the function of it is. We'll just create an issue uh, slash feature request. Uh, then we'll initiate the project with a template in a new branch. And then we'll make a pull request uh, and then we'll merge branches and close the issue. And we will um, do that uh, for the both uh, backend and uh, front end if uh, time allows us. And as I said, uh, I'll be live coding and I might be going a little bit too fast. Uh, so feel free just to stop me anytime and uh, ask any questions. So let's uh, let's do the first step and let's actually create the GitHub repo. Um, so let's go to the GitHub. And we go and create a new repository. So the way I like to name it, I like to name it the, the name of the project, which is going to be rate my course and what part of a stack it is. Uh, so here is the backend. I like to split my backend and front end. Um, there are multiple reasons why I do that, but I just do not like monolithic applications. Uh, I like to make them as small uh, services as much as possible. And I'll make this a repository public. I'll add a license. So if anybody tries to use my code, um, they'll have to reference me. Um, so create the repository, write my course backend. And then right here, you can create the projects. So, and let me explain what the project board is about. So we'll name it backend and we'll just create it automated Kanban. So here we create an kind of an automated Kanban. Let's just archive all the unnecessary notes that we don't need. Um, so here is what the purpose of a Kanban board. Uh, once you're gonna start working in a company, you're pretty much never gonna be uh, an only developer in a, in a team. You'll probably have four or five different teammates. And when four or five different teammates work on some projects, um, they need to be in sync on what, on what each individual is doing. So they don't, don't end up actually doing the work that some other person might be doing. 
So for that purposes, uh, there has been a Kanban board. Um, and it's also used a lot of by product managers who like to organize the features, who like to assign the features to specific developers so they can track the pro progress and then report this um, back to the, to the business. Um, so here is our just basic Kanban board. It has the to-do column where we have all the items that we need to, uh, to do and then in progress and then kind of just done column. Um, so the way we're going to be structuring this uh, for the, all the next sessions, I will be opening up the project board in the beginning and then uh, I'll have the issues um, and I'll show you right now how, to, how we're going to create the issue, which will describe uh, what feature are we trying to, um, to actually code today. And then we'll code that feature and then we'll make a pull request. Um, and then after that, we'll uh, review that and merge that feature. I also will add a collaborator um, just so it doesn't feel like we are um, we are the only the only people here. So Saeed, who's right here. So I'll add him to repository. Uh, so we're working together on this. And then uh, right now I'll make the issue, which is essentially going to describe uh, the feature that we are going to build. And as I said, we don't have a, a necessarily a feature. We just kind of have this project set up. Uh, so I'll just call it backend setup. Um, uh, do backend setup with type ORM template. And I'll explain more in a bit what is type ORM template. So I submit a new issue, I can assign it to myself, I can put it in that Kanban board. Um, I submit an issue, don't think of it, issue could be both bug and a feature request. Um, and then if I go back to my Kanban board, here it is in to-do, uh, I have my issue and it's assigned to me. Uh, and um, here it is and we can look at it. Uh, we can also, teams also like to assign how long it will take to complete one. Um, so you can kind of keep track and allocate uh, and you can say like in two weeks, he here's how much we're going to complete. So business can kind of act accordingly uh, with, the, with the developers. Does the project board and issue make sense in GitHub? There might be uh, some basic material for some, there might be something nobody, like some of you never seen before. Uh, but this is just a good, good tool to manage, um, to manage your projects. And once you get to hire CS classes and once you get your project course, it's just a great tool to do so. There's one question in the chat. Uh, Said was asking if we should, if we work on this project by ourselves, should we fork the repository or should we set up our own? Yeah, okay. So yeah, if, uh, if you would like to kind of follow along and also build this application with me, uh, feel free to set up your own uh, repository uh, because uh, not you usually fork uh, when you try to contribute to that specific repository. If you would like to contribute something or just maybe add on something, if you would like to add the issue, feel free to just go in. I made this public and you can create the issue. For, so for example, for the advanced features that we're going to build, feel free just to file an issue and say, hey, I want to build like authentication with Facebook or Google, or I want to build this and this, or I wanted to do like sort and filter by departments. So definitely feel free to, uh, to type up the issues here and I'll look at them and I'll definitely incorporate all of them uh, once we do the advanced feature session. But uh, if you would like to do it all yourself, I definitely recommend setting up your own repository uh, and do that. Okay, uh, perfect. So now kind of to, to the coding part of it, uh, the way we're going to be working is that, uh, so usually in your, I would say in a CS classes, the way it's being done is that you just kind of push all your changes to the master. That's not the way uh, it is done in any team, pretty much in any company. You usually have to make a separate branch and then you'll make a pull request with that specific branch. And then once that branch, once that pull request got reviewed, uh, 
one of the teammates or you can can just merge this pull request to the master and then the master can go then to production so the way i like to set it up let me open the uh, i term um right here and now i'm just gonna create a new folder which is going to be uh, my project name um and then i'll just go into the directory uh it's empty right now it doesn't have anything um so first of all we would need to um uh, set up the backend as i said and we would do kind of the branch part will be in the end so the way we're going to be setting up the back end and the front end, we essentially will be using existing templates um, that some people already wrote for us. So it's kind of easy to get started. And I'll show you the examples. So if you look up, um, look up type or um, templates, they're all on GitHub. Um, it's kind of, I can just Google like this express. Type or run. And this one's with the graph kill. Uh, yeah, I just want to show one kind of kind of the example of how the template is gonna look like. Yeah, so this is this is the basic template. Uh this is by type ORM. This is just ORM, the abstractions on the database that we're going to be using. So essentially, some people from this uh from who contribute to this open source library, they build this template. So template, um think of it as something that's already been done for you. Uh it's kind of like a, like a code that you receive from the professor, which kind of easy to start up and easy to run. Uh the only issue sometimes it could be outdated. Uh, so that's why we're not necessarily going to be using this template, but we will be using uh, their CLI commands. Um, so the advantage of a template is that you don't have to set up all the parts yourself, because sometimes some of the libraries can be very funky in the way you set them up, and you have to be very specific on what you do. So that's why I really like to use predefined templates, because that's already people kind of went through all these issues and the bugs, and they kind of polished it up. So all you get is you just kind of get like a ready product that you just copy or like clone your on your local machine and um it is just up and running um so that's what we're going to do both for the back end and the, and the front end so we'll go to the i term um and let me just make the full screen so for this we'll be using type rm cli and cli is just kind of um it's a tool built by that specific library uh, that allows to perform multiple operations. So if you're familiar with like package managers like Brew or Chocolate or just different uh, different tools that you could be using on command line and like NPM, there's just like one of them. Um, so right now we'll be setting up the, the backend, uh, backend folder uh, with this specific template. So it's type or RAM. Um, and then I have it say here, but it's essentially you do you init, uh, which is initiate the product, then the fault uh, initiate the project, then you would name it, which is we're just going to name it the way we named our repository, rate my course backend. Um, then we will add, add the database to it. Uh, so since we're using MongoDB, it kind of has a predefined template. Um, and then we'll be using Express, and then we also will be using Docker. Uh, and then the reason why we're using Docker is we're going to be using this in the best session. Don't worry about it right now. Don't have to understand. It's just easy to uh, have it set up right now. Uh, so once we run the command, it was actually a project created inside the directory. So now we can actually see the directory. Uh, let's open up the director. I have this code, so I have a shortcut code and a dot, uh, which is essentially opens up the VS code in that specific directory. And uh, you can see right here, the VS code got open and in source, we, we see a bunch of different files, which as I said, don't worry about it right now. You don't have to understand completely what it does. Um, here is just the basic commands on how to start up this project. Uh, it's using NPM either Docker Compose. Don't worry about Docker Compose. That's we'll cover this 
in advanced session. Uh, so let's just start to start up this project and see what it does. We'll be using NPM, it's a package manager. Uh, think of it as something, if you need to cook some dish, you have a recipe and it has a variety of different um, goods that you need to bring. So NPM kind of manage all these ingredients and manages all this thing together and puts this recipe together. So NPM does the same thing for the dependencies of your project. Uh, so we'll install all the dependencies as it says on the readme. Uh, and let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, so NPM install. So that might take a little while. Um, and then also once we get to the front end, I'll also show the another package manager tool called Yarn, um, which is kind of just give you exposure to different package managers to, tools. I personally have been liking to use Yarn lately simply because it's just been going faster than NPM is. So we install all the dependencies, kind of says edit 168 packages. And then we can just start up the project and PM start. Um, and then the start script, we'll call the, uh, the start script in a package JSON. It's right here. Uh, and it says, okay, so it says, warning access non-existent property monger error of model export inside circular dependence. So here's what happened. Uh, since we initiated with the MongoDB, we tried to connect to the MongoDB client that we actually don't have running yet. So let's actually get the MongoDB client, the client running. Um, there was a, in, uh, in the email that I sent out yesterday, I mentioned the MongoDB client. So it's uh, MongoDB community. Um, and you can install it on your local machine and run uh, a local database. Um, so you can kind of, we can look it up right now. Uh, it's, okay. oh, it's right here. Oh, what, okay. We're, we're yes. using Docker, right? Why aren't we setting up the database in, in, in a container? Yeah, so uh, Docker is, uh, as I said, we, we could do everything in Docker uh, right off the bat, uh, but I just want to show what, what's actually happening under the hood okay. and uh, how you, a lot of companies still run NPMs and they don't, and not a lot of companies use Docker. So I think Docker will be an abstraction on what we're actually building right now. Uh, so we can actually understand what, what is happening inside of the Docker container once we get to the Docker. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you. Okay, so as I said, uh, here's kind of installation, brew install. I already have it installed. Uh, if you don't just run this kernel with brew or if you have windows use that um so i already have it installed and then to run it you just do brew services start and then you just do mongodb community um so it's already started to restart okay so let me just restart this um And uh, actually I realized it might've been working. I was just, that was just a warning, not an error. Okay, yeah, so it's restarted and let's run our backend server again. Okay, it's actually saying warning. So it thinks that was just a warning with the way uh, the connection is being initiated, but it seems to be working at the server. So if we go to local host, um, 3000 and hit users, we'll get the response, nice and neat response from the backend. So the backend is running. And the way you can also connect to the database is that for the MongoDB, there was a tool called Robo3T. Um, and I already have the connection, but I can probably create a new one, uh, just local host and port is 27017. Uh, you kind of save it and then you connect to it. And then you can just see my local databases that I've ran, but you'll probably like, if you never use MongoDB locally, you'll just have a, a empty, empty, empty database here. Nothing will be existing. But if you ever want to examine the database that you're running locally, 
uh, or if we're later on gonna run Docker container, and we're still going to be able to examine the databases. Uh, that could be quite useful. So the backend is uh, set up. Uh, so we just set up from the template. So well, let's right now push this to GitHub uh, and actually uh, submit a pull request. So we don't have a, a Git project initiated there. So let's just initiate the Git project, uh, initialize the empty repository, and let's add the remote origin. So it connects to our, um, our repository that we created. Git add remote origin, and then it's just the name of the repo. So I'll just copy it. Didn't match any files. Okay. Uh, and sometimes I I also might not remember all Git add the remote. Sometimes could, could also make mistakes. So that's kind of the way I debug. Usually I just go ahead and Google stuff. And yes, it's not the link. It's actually, it has to be a remote URL. Um, let me clear that so you can see. Uh, get remote at origin. And then I go and I see the remote URL. It's right here, I think, in Chrome. Yes, I copy this. It's, so it's added get remote list, I think. Uh, or just get remote just to see. Oh yeah, so it has the origin right now. So now we can, so here is how we're going to submit the pull request. So first we're going to check out the branch, the new, the new branch. And the way I like to be doing this, I based it off of the issue number and kind of the issue title. So the number of issue is number one, and then the title is um, backend setup. So I'll do get, Check out B, which is means branch, and I'll do one, and then backend setup. And what what would this do? This would check out the, the uh, new branch on your local machine, but not on remote. Um, so you actually want to push it remote, and then you want to submit pull request using the remote branch uh, to the remote master. Uh, so the way we'll just add the file. So do git status. Um, Let's see, I think we have git ignore, or let me double check so we don't push the node modules. Yes, we do have uh, git ignore. So we don't ever want to put not push node modules uh, to the GitHub repo. That's something you do locally, and it's actually pretty heavy. Um, so put this in git ignore. Also, we don't want to put push our secrets. So let's make .env file, which is going we, where we're going to make uh, store our secrets. And let's add this to dot. Uh, to dot uh, get ignore. Um, There's a question in the chat. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so like one of the question was, oh, uh, so should we be creating a new branch for each issue? Uh, yes, and sometimes if the issue is big enough, you actually want to split it up, maybe create multiple issues or actually have multiple branches that link back to that to that issue. So for example, let's assume if we split up the backend setup into, for example, uh, just initiate a template and then the setup the database connection. Then we can check out the uh, branch, for, exa for example, with the name one template setup and then one database setup. And then we can actually link both of these branches to the issue. And then it's kind of the whole idea is you try to separate um, you try to separate your pull request and your logic into multiple branches. So once the reviewer sees your code, uh, it's easier for them to review it, uh, and it's easier to review five hundred lines than it is to review ten thousand lines. Uh, so that's where the whole idea of separating into small. Uh, branches and like small pull requests and separating these big issues into small ones comes comes in. So okay, does it does it answer your question? Okay, cool. And there was another question uh Savan asked um are we actually supposed to be working on this project or uh, is it better if we watch you implement everything? Yeah so that's uh if you would, uh, so as I said, I could be a little bit going too fast, but you're definitely more than welcome to follow, follow this along. And I think if you would follow this along, because that's how I learn personally, just from watching YouTube videos and following along, 
if you could follow along and be with me and if you kind of get lost you can either like just poke me and uh, i can kind of slow down a little bit or you can also re-watch the recording of this session and um uh, and just kind of do it all but i think it's if you would like to have just like a nice a nice project that you actually set up actually learn a lot uh, I would definitely recommend like I, either follow along during the session or after the session, like watch a recording and actually do it yourself because it's very easy to look at someone doing it. Uh, but once you actually start doing that yourself, that could be a little bit complicated because you can run in, into unexpected issues. And so just one, know if, you, if that answers your question. Or if you want, if you want us to elaborate more on that. Okay, cool. Just one uh, quick question about the type ORM. We don't have to have anything installed for that. Just we're just able to type that into the CD, CMD and we're good. Yeah, great, great, great question. So type ORM. Uh, let me show you. Uh, I in email yesterday I sent the link, but uh, type ORM CLI. If you go to type ORM official documentation and you hit this using CLI, um, the first command, I think right here, installing CLI, uh, and you just install TS node. And then I think it should, yes. So it's type NPM install global and type ORM. So I can type up the command in the terminal. NPM install global type ORM. So once you install the globally, you should be access uh, type or MCLI. So pretty much, pretty much you, I think a lot of tools that we'll be using, you can just install directly with NPM. So if you don't have them, uh, just use NPM or check, check the documentation. They have a fantastic documentation. Um, any more questions? Okay. So let's let's make our pull request. Uh, so let's uh, actually add the files, uh, git add all, uh, and then let's actually make the commit. So git commit uh, finish basic project setup. Um, forgot the quote. Uh, let's see if I put all the files. It's clean. So now actually let's. Let's push it, um, push it to the remote branch. It push your origin. You have to set up the upstream, which is essentially just kind of setting up the, the connection to the remote branch. Um, so just copy and paste this command. And, um, and then I can actually push it right now. If it hasn't, yeah, okay. So set up the track, so it's already been pushed. So once I set up that upstream, it's, it's already got pushed. So it gives you a nice link here, uh, how you can create the pull request. Uh, so we just open this in the browser. Um, there isn't anything to compare. Okay, so let me actually go here and compare pull request. I entirely different commit histories, okay. Uh, so we might have a little bit. Uh, I think oh, okay. the issue with master and main branch because I also stumbled upon this issue somewhere. Yeah, so I think uh, we actually might have a little bit uh, messed up the, the setup uh, because of that license that we created here. Um, so let's uh, to resolve that. Uh, let's uh, merge the the master branch into the backend setup. Sometimes when you have the merge conflicts and you have some team members working um, working in, uh, and submitting a pull request to master, you could have these conflicts. I'm not sure if that's going to solve this, but let's try. So check out the master. Uh, I change your file and I'll get okay. I see. So what happened is that when we set up the remote origin, we didn't actually pull the master branch. So git pull uh, uh, view origin master. Okay. Get pull. Okay. So here is our master branch. Uh, so let's check out this master branch that we just 
for the mode. Um, let's make sure it's up to date uh, using Git pull. And then let's check out back to the branch that we just used. And let's merge that master into a local branch and hopefully that resolves. Refusing to merge unrelated histories. Okay, uh, happens. I think when I initiate the projects, I shouldn't have done that. Um, so I can actually look this up um, and see if uh, some people had the same issue. Um, I can just use IWAL oh, well, unrelated history. I don't know if that's going to break anything. Can we make a pull request, uh, but like a separate this, from just GitHub, uh, GitHub UI? Can we make a uh, what? Can we just make a pull request separately, like using GitHub UI? And pull requests, not from that um, branch to master, but from master to that branch, and then resolve issues from GitHub? Uh, technically, you can. I mean, uh, you would usually don't want to, to do pull request and GitHub from master to the local branch. You usually want to merge master uh, to your local branch locally. Um, and then once after you do that, you want to push your branch and you want to merge your developer branch to the master branch remotely on, on the actual GitHub UI. So you, you're not, you don't necessarily want to merge master into your feature branch uh, using GitHub UI. Can you explain um, the process of so, PRs and merging uh, different branches? Like, uh, I think I was confused. Yeah, so essentially the process is, is that you have kind of like a main master branch and you have, for example, four or three developers on your team working on different features. And then uh, they, you don't want all of them to be pushing to master because you could have a massive merge conflicts. So you, what you would want to do is you want to check out a separate branch. And once you completed your features, you want to add these changes on top of the master so they can actually reside in master. Um, so the whole idea of just like having a version control and not having a lot of merge conflicts, uh, that's, that's where kind of all these different branches come in. Yeah, so when we finish the, finish the development of our feature uh, in our branch, we merge all of those changes into master, right? Yes, yes. So once we once we finish the development of all the features in the local branch, we merge that into master. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So let's uh, let's. Uh, any other questions before I proceed? Try to solve this. Okay. So let me try uh, see. Uh, if I can solve the yes, get push you origin. Um, and see if I can. Yep, so here it is. Uh, I'm opening the pull request using my uh, using my feature branch into master. So I'll just call it backend setup. Uh, here is another GitHub trick that I like to use. Uh, it's a word co called closes, which will automatically close the issue that I'm working at. And I know that and it will close it by the number of the issue, which is in my name. So it closes one. I will also assign Saeed as reviewer. Uh, and then I'll just create a pull request here. And um, uh, this this is I mean this is huge pull request usually like I do not recommend like when you do setup it's fine but when you work on features uh, I would recommend making uh, rather like a lot of small pull requests rather than a big one because if if someone will have to go through your code right now and look through three thousand line changes that could be very tedious and they will essentially miss something that could be important. Uh, and if they do so, like that code might end up in production, it might actually break a product. Uh, so small pull request um, and uh, kind of small pull request and just more frequent uh, updates, I would say. So Saeed left a comment. He said, type around doesn't have a link to set up here. Do you want to have separate issue for that? Yeah, so once, once, once uh, one of the critical parts also of development setup is the linter. 
which type of RAM template doesn't have. The linter, if you've taken ISD, it's just something that magically beautifies your code. Um, so yeah, so we are not going to include this into this pull request, but we are just going to make a, a separate issue for that uh, once we merge this. Um, so good question, Saeed. Uh, okay. So, and then say once, uh, once he approves, we can merge this pull request. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. So he just merged it. Uh, it's, it's so sometimes person approves it and they merge right away. It's uh, perfectly fine to, you don't necessarily have to merge it. And so what happened is all of our features from the branch that we just put got, got merged into master. So if we open the, the code and the master branch, we could see all the features and all the code that we just wrote. And it just kind of got built up here. Uh, and it's all populated here. And the remote branch didn't get deleted still here, but we can also uh, set up in settings that the, that remote branch will get deleted once you merge the pull request. So you don't pollute your, uh, your GitHub and you don't pollute your Git. Does that make sense on the backend uh, setup? Um, you all have any questions, um, concerns? Okay, we are about one hour right now. Um, would you like all to, for me to do a front-end setup? It will be the basic kind of the basic flow. Uh, I'll just use the create re create React app template. Uh, would you like uh, me to show you all how to do that? Okay, okay, sounds perfect. So let's make a new repository uh, for, for the front end. Um, so rate my course front end. Um, so it's available, set up the basic license. So nobody can steal our code. Um, and then we'll create the repository. Um, so sa same kind of idea, we'll just make a basic issue uh, really fast, but the same ideas we had in the backend. So just front end setup, I'm assigned myself. Uh, doesn't have a project in this one, but I'll make it uh, up to the session. Uh, so for this case, let's just clone the, the folder on our local machine uh, instead of uh, kind of connecting re remote. So let's go back here. Let's CD out uh, and back to the rate my course folder. Here we already have rate my course backend. And so let's now clone the, the front end repository. Uh, we cloned it. Uh, here it is. Rate my course the front end. Let's go into this. Um, and you already see the Git is here, uh, the license is here. So let's actually initiate uh, initiate the project. And we'll be using create React app for this. Create React app. It's just a template that's pretty much the Facebook developed to set up the, uh, the React app. And we will be using uh, we're using TypeScript. So let's see the flags for the TypeScript. Uh, doesn't have them here specifically, but I have them in my uh, create. So I just woke up quickly with TypeScript. Uh, adding a TypeScript. Installation, here it is. Give you NPX, uh, which essentially NPM just pulling, pulling from remote. Uh, or we can just use yarn, which is another package manager. So it would just copy and paste this command um, and, and it will create React app and my app, uh, it usually creates the folder, but we just need to create within the folder. So just put dot and we put the template TypeScript. Okay, so you want to proceed. So once that installed, we pretty much will have a front end uh, up Can and running. Can you explain why you decided to choose TypeScript instead of just JavaScript? Yeah, of course. So uh, the TypeScript is uh, essentially a type version of JavaScript. 
uh, except it only checks uh, during the compile time. So there was no runtime check, but um, as you probably all had experience uh, developing C++ or any other type languages, uh, it makes it very easy for the developer uh, to use the type languages because there was a lot of kind of like hints on like what the methods are, uh, what type of variables you have. So actually TypeScript allows you to prevent a lot of bugs that you could have in production by uh, checking all these uh, errors during compile time and, and telling you if something, for example, if you're trying to assign number to a string, the TypeScript would, would complain. So that's kind of just, I would say like, it's a type checker for JavaScript. And, if, and also it's good for refactoring if you wrote an enormous uh, application and you would like to refactor something with JavaScript, it's very hard to do so because you need to, it won't actually hint you where you need to make the changes while the TypeScript will actually tell you where you would need to make the change, the necessary uh, changes in order not to break the rest of our application. Does that make sense? Okay, perfect. So we had uh, we had create React app set up. Uh, let's just go in and see what's what we got there. Um, so kind of same same files. We got some React app here. Uh, we'll touch more, but just the basic React app, some CSS styles, uh, the HTML that uh, we've talked about a little bit uh, right here. So all the code is generated and, and populated into that HTML. Um, and uh, so let's just start it up. Uh, so first we want to probably install all the dependencies. Uh, let's use Yarn. Yarn is the code of NPM. Uh, just give you exposure to different package managers. Uh, could be confusing, but they do the same thing under the hood. One just does a little bit more efficiently in my opinion. So Yarn install, same as NPM install. It will install all the dependencies. And then Yarn start, that will start the development uh, server, which will then show it in our browser. So it's automatically starts up. Um, and once it's, yep, it's right here. So we can see just the basic React app that you get from the template and if you go to learn react there's just a, re a react website uh so pretty much done uh the front end sup setup is done uh so we just exit out and let's just make uh, the same kind of thing new branch and then make a pull request and then we we'll just merge it to master so we we'll just get check out branch one front end setup uh we'll see what our files are uh and then we'll just add them all and we'll commit the files, um, finish front end setup. And then we'll just push it to, uh, to the origin. So all the same steps as we did in the back end, um, just, just with the front end. And we pushed and we'll make a pull request. Once again, the same way we did with the, with the back end. Uh, now I also have to add Saeed so he can look it over. Uh, manage Jackson's web collaborator. Add Saeed's repository. So he's edited now. Uh, I probably have to refresh the page until he until he accepts. But essentially same uh, same kind of workflow that we did with the backend. Uh, just with the front end. Uh, so just I just create the pull request. Um, and uh, he's still not in. And But once essentially once this being reviewed, and in this case, we don't have to worry about it because they just set up, we can just merge this and we make the merge commit, uh, which essentially just additional commit that um, that, that being uh, stacked on top of the master. And here we are in master with our code that we just uh, install locally, push to the remote branch and then merge into the master. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's kind of it uh, for the setup. Um, this thing also doesn't have a linter, uh, but we'll also set this up um, while, we will be, while we'll be doing the front end. Um, 
any questions uh, was this like too hard too easy uh, do you guys know uh, what was going on uh, just any, any any feedback you guys have I just feel like there's a bunch of new technologies that are just kind of being thrown around and obviously I think that's going to get better with um, actually trying it out myself um, by looking at the recording but just um, for a generality like all the things that you set up right now are sort of in a default state of what you just kind of made right of, of stuff that you put it in the command run yeah pretty much everything everything pretty much is just kind of default template that you got from some other people we haven't really like wrote in any code we just yeah. we just did a basic setup so we can just get up and running in the next session so we don't have to do anything and cool. i also wanted to show you all that so if you ever have to set up a project yourself you kind of just know how to easily do that i mean it took us like 20 minutes to do that and we are ready to go write some code cool there's a question in the chat so is asking uh if we have any questions about about the stuff we did what is the best way to contact you? Yeah, so there is an email I can. Um, there is an email that I sent you all. It has my email, so you can just email me. Uh, also, Ilya, you wanna write up my email in the chat? I can't pull up the chat. Yeah, one second. I, I will. This. Yeah, so feel free to email me uh, anytime, just with any questions. Yes, I found the chat finally. Yeah, so if you have any questions, I also will try. So the email that I sent last night was kind of late. Uh, I apologize about that. So I'll try to send them out at least like on Thursdays. So you guys maybe have like more time just to go through the technologies and just to understand what we'll be working on, uh, kind of read through. Uh, and then so it kind of makes more sense once we come to it. So it doesn't feel like I'm just throwing lots of technologies at you. But yeah, definitely like rewatch the rec recording and look back to that email and just try to read like through the npm or like what type of rm is uh, just go kind of on a website and see what what they do and we'll also set up a slack channel for you guys to join and you'll be able to ask questions there uh we'll send we'll send a, an invite in a later email and apart from that if you guys have time please fill out the the feedback form i'm sending it in the chat once again right now uh we really want to make this our workshops better and more interesting to you so feedback will be helpful and yeah and if you guys have any other questions feel free to ask them right now or tap them, tap them in the chat yeah essentially i'm trying to make this all workshop about you guys and uh once we pr proceed with the basic ones of just like writing some back end endpoints and writing some front end the advanced feature sessions we could have one or couple i would just like to build something that you're really interested in or we just kind of maybe that that seemed a little bit challenging for you to set up on your own uh, so i would i'll be more than happy uh, to do that for you and show you how we can do it so we can build it together and then you can you can do it on your own time and just kind of walk through it and uh, figure it out Do you have any like suggestions for readings before the next lecture or anything like that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll send out the email on the backend specific stuff and I'll just try to have like just maybe a couple like maybe two or three tutorials that you can just scroll through uh, and kind of see how we're going to do them. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely send out the email. I'll, I'll definitely send out uh, earlier than this time. Uh, so you have more time to, to look at this. But yeah, this is essentially this class uh, or this workshop is very similar to what being taught in web-based system architecture, um, CS4288. Uh, stack is pretty much the same, except Gram doesn't use, doesn't use type of RAM. Um, so we'll be using that. Um, so that 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 could uh, that pretty much this is a mirror of that class and. Um, if you follow along and um, kind of do it on your own, you learn a lot that's, I mean, can actually get you a full stack job right out of college. So that's a lot of these technologies is what I use. Um, 
every day on a daily basis uh, at my workplace. On that note, could you uh, run through uh, like projects or positions you've had in the past and just your experiences with it? Yeah, of course, of course. So as I said, I self-taught my freshman year. I was hooked up to this huge channel called uh, Coding Garden. Um, it's kind of similar to like Ben Awad. If you know him, he just like does live coding. And I was just kind of learning, like following along and like try to code, like watching the recording. That's how I got started. And then the past summer, I worked in a small startup in UK um, remotely. So they doing a lot of um, they do a lot of machine learning and document processing for the banks and file forwarding companies. Um, so I was a full stack engineer there. I was building front end React. The backend was all Python. I was working with Postgres, SQL database, was also orchestrating a lot of microservices, just Kubernetes and cloud. Um, and then right now, so since August until right now, I'm working in this small e-commerce st startup here in Nashville. Um, we, I'm also full stack dev there. Uh, we do Vue.js on the front end and we do PHP and domain-driven design on the back end uh, with a lot of tests. Uh, we also deploy everything to the cloud. We use serverless there. Um, and after I graduate, uh, I'm just going to join the company in Boston called NetApp and they doing cloud computing. So I'll be doing, I'll be working a lot with the uh, cloud and Kubernetes and Docker and that sort of related stuff. But definitely like all the, for me to get my full job at the startup, uh, definitely like I, all this stuff that I use there was all self-taught. A lot of the, a lot of the information that you get out of CS classes, uh, it's sometimes it's, uh, not very applicable to what you actually will be doing at the job place, or maybe the place where I work wasn't too applicable. Um, so for me, like everything that I learned about building full stack application using JavaScript, that's that's all I did uh, in the past uh, in the past two workplaces. So yeah, so that's that's definitely useful and uh, cool stuff. And if you're interested, like that's awesome. And I will be if you're interested, like in any resources, feel free to email me. I'll be more than happy to share like any resources I used to learn. And I would recommend just kind of uh, reading and following along uh, for you to kind of get going in your free time. Um, so yeah.